Welcome to KPIs, The Mystery of a Recipe. As we discussed in our previous video, The Mystery of Your Operational Difficulties, we will now apply our mystery method to an example most of us are more familiar with, a food recipe. Looking at our mystery, there are a couple basic questions we want to ask ourselves. First, what is a recipe? A recipe is a set of instructions that describe how to make something, especially food. Though recipes come in many forms, they generally follow a format. What is that format? Well, recipes will generally provide certain information. The name of the dish, the cook time, the prep time, how many people it will serve, the ingredients, how to prepare the ingredients, and instructions for how to prepare the dish. Recipes are typically laid out in terms of sequential order. The ingredients are listed in the order that they are used, and the steps are laid out in the order that they are performed. The question of whether or not certain steps can be done in parallel is typically left for the reader to discern for themselves, though some recipes are better than others when it comes to that. For the purpose of example, we are going to look at a recipe for a broccoli and chicken stir-fry. This recipe and image comes courtesy of the Food Network by way of Pat and Gina Neely, co-stars of the cooking show Down Home with the Neelys. As we saw in our recipe format, this recipe provides us with the prep time, cook time, and number of servings. It also provides us with a measure of the difficulty of this recipe, easy. By many cooking standards, I would agree with their assessment of difficulty, but we need to remember that it's not the assessment of the recipe provider that makes this process successful but the assessment of the cook. With a difficulty level assessment of easy, you can imagine an inexperienced cook finding this recipe and wanting to give it a try. Being a fairly inexperienced cook myself, I did just that. Let's continue down the path and see how an inexperienced cook might approach this recipe. Here we have a list of all the ingredients that go into this recipe. Assuming our cook needs to go grocery shopping, he or she would look through the list of ingredients look at what they have in their refrigerator, freezer, cabinets, and or pantry, figure out what they need to buy, and then purchase them on their next grocery shopping trip. Are there any ingredients here that would not be obvious to find when taking a trip through the grocery store? Well, garlic for one, at the store is typically sold in bulbs, which contain multiple cloves. You can imagine how different this might taste if someone minced and used four bulbs of garlic instead of four cloves of garlic probably not high on Dracula's list. Chicken thighs can be bought at the store, but they're not always boneless or skinless. On top of that, you would need to be cut into pieces at home, unless the grocery has a butcher. Add on to that, that if the chicken thighs were frozen, they need to be defrosted. You don't want to fry frozen meat. Ginger bought at the store is sold whole, but the peeling and chopping would, be have, would have to be done at home. The same with the green onions, which would be sliced at home. Broccoli is typically sold in one of two ways, either fresh and whole, or frozen in florets and spears. If you buy it whole, you have to chop the florets yourself. Either way, you have to do the blanching at home. The layout of the directions suggests that there are four processes in this recipe. 1. Make the sauce. 2. Cook the chicken. 3. Saute the vegetables. and 4. Put it all together. Given the timing that they've listed, this is how we get to our 10 minute cook time. It seems simple enough. Now we will bring our recipe into our mystery methodology. It's important to remember that every mystery has the following core elements. Characters, setting, plot, clues, assumptions, distractions, structure, and conclusion. We'll find these elements in our mystery as well. We'll go into each of these in more detail. Let's take a look at the characters in our mystery. First, we have our main characters. Let's start with the victims. Now, don't get hung up on the term victim. In this case, victim really only means the recipient of the problem and the possible recipient of the solution. Now, since we're talking about the one-time cooking of a meal, we really don't have any past or present victims, only a future one, and those would be the people that will be served this food and who will be hungry. Next, we'll look at our investigators. These would be the proponents of the solution. Well, we have our lead investigator, who's the cook, and we have our investigative team or our support team, which would be the buyer of the groceries, if it's not the cook, the assistant cook, if there is one, and the owner of the kitchen, cookware, utensils, and appliances, 
assuming they don't belong to the cook. And lastly, we'll take a look at our suspects and our culprits. And the, by these, we mean the proponents of the problem. Well, the first is hunger. Are, the, are our victims, are the people that we're serving this food to, going to be hungry? The second is going to be palate. Do the victims, or the people that we're serving this food to, like broccoli, chicken, and stir-fried foods? Lastly, we want to take a look at the other characters in our mystery. And by these, I mean our ingredients, the store that we go to to buy these ingredients, as well as the kitchen, the cookware, the utensils, and the appliances that we use to prepare this meal. These all play a key role in whether or not we will have a successful resolution. Now let's take a look at the setting of our mystery. It's important to note that in this example we have a known problem and a known solution. The mystery part is the execution. So we're going to take a look at our setting as well as other components in light of that problem and in light of that solution. So first, when does the problem happen? Well, let's look at it in terms of our problem. Our problem which is twofold, is hunger, which happens multiple times each day, typically addressed by one of three meals, and we're fixing a dish for one of those three meals. And palate, which is the taste for broccoli, chicken, and stir-fried food, well, we're going to say with our recipients, it's a near constant. These are things they like, though they'd probably not like to eat the same thing every day. So our solution is that we're going to serve a dinner of broccoli and chicken stir-fry to our victims at or around 7 p.m. Next, where does the problem happen? Well, again, our problem is hunger and palate, and these two things are independent of place. The desire to eat something and the liking of certain foods are pretty constant across any location. So, in our solution, we're going to cook a meal in our kitchen, complete with a stove. Another thing to factor in is we're going to use a kitchen that's in the U.S. because the units that the ingredients call for are U.S. standard measurements. It's probably safe to say that we could not cook this meal in our employee kitchen or break room at work. We may have some difficulty cooking this meal in a hotel room, and we absolutely could. When looking at the clues to our recipe mystery, this is where we find out how comprehensive our recipe is. It's important to remember that information is king. What information do we have? Well, we have the recipe, with its list of ingredients and directions. Is there any information we don't have? Well, we would need to scan the recipe to see if any part of it doesn't immediately make sense. You want to see the process for yourself. This recipe was put together by professionals. They aren't thinking about what is obvious and oblivious to them, such as how do you measure? It calls for a half a tablespoon here, a whole tablespoon there. Well, you would need a set of measuring spoons to measure that. There's a call for two cups. Well, you would need a measuring cup. There's also a call for one pound. Well, if you want to be exact, you would need a food scale or something like it. Is there anything they've included that you don't understand? Well, let's first take a look at the ingredient sub-processes. One pound of boneless, skinless chicken thighs cut into half-inch pieces. What kind of knife do I use to cut it with? What do I cut it on? You know, could I do this with a butter knife on my countertop? You could, but it's probably not your best course of action. Next, we've got the two tablespoons of peeled and chopped ginger. Well, what do I peel ginger with? Can I do it like an orange? No, not likely. And what kind of knife do I use to chop it with? You probably don't want to use your butter knife. The same could be said for the green onions, which require slicing. And then there's the two cups of broccoli florets blanched. Well, first, what's a floret? If I bought broccoli whole, how am I supposed to figure out what a floret is? And how do I create one? And then on top of that, what's blanching? Well, if you don't know these things, that can yank your prep time up substantially. I know it did for me the first time I attempted this recipe. Well, let's also look at other things that are included that, you know, maybe they didn't call out. Well, there's a call for a small bowl for mixing things in, a whisk to mix things with, 
and a walk. Well, a small bowl is a small bowl. Some form of small bowl will work. As for a whisk, is a whisk the only way you can mix something? No, not really. You could use a fork. Um, as for a walk, is a walk absolutely necessary to stir fry something? Well, no, it's not absolutely necessary, and quite a lot of people don't own walks. So, yeah, you could use a frying pan and stir fry just the same. But if there's any questions about the explicit or implicit directions of the recipe, you'd want to check other sources and call in your experts. One, obviously, could be to check foodnetwork.com, which is the source of the recipe. Or you could do an internet search on Google or Wikipedia. You could check with a reference cookbook if you happen to have one handy. Or you can choose the route that I chose, which is to ask a more experienced cook. Now we come to the assumptions in our recipe mystery. Don't predetermine the scope. The scope of the recipe says that it makes three to four servings. Well, what if I need to feed six to eight or more people? Completing this recipe would not be enough. Adjustments would have to be made to the quantities to make more than one of this dish. And if so, not all ingredients need to or should be directly multiplied to make more than one of this dish. For example, cooking oil is variable depending on the lube condition of the pan and the size of the pan. The measurements in this recipe use U.S. customary units of measurement. Tablespoon, pound, cup. Well, what if I wanted to make this recipe in a country that uses the metric system? Well, we would have to convert all of the measurements to metric. We may also need to find out the translated names of those ingredients if we're not in a predominantly English-speaking country. Are there ingredients that are replaceable? For instance, if peanut oil is not available, are there other oils that you can stir-fry with? If light brown sugar isn't available, will dark brown sugar still work? Would regular white sugar work? Are there ingredients that you can do without and not substantially change the resulting dish? For example, if you don't have green onions, the recipe will still come out very good. If you don't have chicken, it's not really the same. Don't accept another scope. The recipe says that the difficulty level is easy. If you have little to no experience with cooking, this may not be easy at all. You got measuring and chopping and peeling and frying. The cook time looks as though it's solid, but the prep time is highly variable depending on the skills of the cook. And lastly, what are the untrue facts? Well, the recipe specifies medium-high heat. Well, depending on the power of your stove, whether it's gas or electric, and the condition of your wok or frying pan, medium-high heat may mean different things. If your stove runs hotter than average, you may have to shoot for a lower setting or adjust your cooking time down so you don't risk burning your food. If your stove doesn't run as hot as average, you may have to shoot for a higher heat setting or adjust your cooking time up so that you don't risk serving uncooked chicken. Now we'll look at the distractions. What are the competing priorities for your time and your energy in putting this recipe together? Well, is there something going on with friends or family that might take you away from the cooking process? Do you have the pressure of hungry customers up against you? I know we have little ones at home and I can tell you when they're hungry, there's pressure. You know, is, are you likely to receive a phone call that might defer you from your cooking process or just distract your attention? Is there something going on on the television, news story, sporting event that might grab your attention? Or if we go to the most basic level, are you likely to have a call of nature in the middle of your cooking process? Any and all of these things can be primary distractions and drastically impact how well your solution comes to be. Remember, nothing aids a problem or diverts a solution like a distracted focus. In looking at the structure of our recipe, we want to take a look at the voice of the customer. Well, the customer wants a meal. 
but they want some qualities to go along with that meal. They want a fully cooked meal, which is the quality of the food. They want a just recently cooked meal, which is to say they want it fresh and still hot. They want a meal that will sate their hunger, which means it has to have sufficient quantity. And they want that meal to come when they are hungry, which means it has to be on time or timely. And on top of that, they probably want a meal that's delicious, which is a superlative and subjective quality. Next, looking at the voice of the process, what does the investigative team or the solution provider, or in this case the cook, want? Well, they want to cook a meal. And they want to cook a meal that will satisfy their customer, which again is going to be timely, and it's going to be of sufficient quantity, and it's going to be of sufficient quality, meaning fully cooked. But they also want to cook a meal that will delight their customer, which will be that it arrives fresh and hot, and is also considered delicious to the customer. Lastly, we want to take a look at the voice of the business. Well, the voice of the business is similar to the voice of the customer in this regard in that they want a meal. But, simply enough, they want a meal that will sate their hunger, enough quantity. They want a meal that will suit their taste, sufficient quality. And they want a meal to come when they are hungry, or timely. Finally, we come to the conclusion of our recipe, and we want to make sure that we're catching the problem before the act. Now both your victim, or your customer, and your culprit, the business, want the solution when they are hungry. Well, you originally set as your serving goal at around 7 p.m. Well, what happens if they're hungry before 7 p.m.? Well, that would require the cooking to start in advance of your original scheduled start time. It's worth noting that some processes can be done well in advance of need, depending on the needs of your customer. Had the customer not requested that the food be fresh or just cooked, you could have cooked a day in advance and simply reheated the food. Well, what if the customer is not hungry by 7? Well, this might require that your dish sit and cool, and then be reheated by some means when the customer decides that they're hungry. Well, what if the preparation and cooking take longer than expected? If we go by our new cook example, that's probable. If you're working backward from your deadline, did you leave yourself some lag time to accommodate for extra time in preparation or in cooking? Next, let's see how we're addressing the problem. As mentioned before, there are three ways to address a problem. Defense, detainment, or destruction. Well, as our problem, or the culprit, is hunger, which is never permanently sated. This method of problem solving, which is cooking and serving a meal, is really detainment, meaning it'll hold the hunger at bay for a time. But there are additional problems that we need to make sure that we're addressing. One such is the recipe mentions transferring all of the dish into a serving bowl. Well, Serving is probably one of the key things. Are we going to provide individual serving plates and bowls and utensils? This would seem an obvious step, but you would witness the impact quickly if you were serving six to eight people and only had four place settings. Another is, will this dish alone be enough, or should you serve a side dish? Well, if the recipe makes the assumption of this dish as a main dish, with side dishes to be served alongside, your three to four servings may not be enough to sate the hunger of three to four people. Next, do you have somewhere for all your guests to sit, preferably together, to enjoy the meal together? Now, this is not a stated issue of the customer or of the business, but it may be an implicit requirement for enjoying the meal. No one wants to feel put out by eating apart from everyone else. And lastly, we come to the aftermath. Was everyone satisfied with the meal? If the recipe directions, both explicit and implicit, were followed, the stated needs met, and the implicit desires of the customer satisfied, the answer should be a yes. Now, some variations may be acceptable. If you were to serve the meal 5 to 15 minutes after 7, or provide more food than was needed, or if the food had to be reheated for serving purposes, that may be acceptable to still have everyone be satisfied with your solution. Some variations have the potential to destroy the positive impact of everything else, 
Examples of this would include undercooked or overcooked food, not enough place settings or seats, or not enough food. But ultimately, you have to ask yourself the question, were the victims or the customers better off with the solution? If you can say that they received enough food to sate their hunger, you have a win. Believe me when I tell you, ask the parent of any young child, that is a win. Thank you for taking part in this presentation, and we look forward to helping you drive your performance to new levels in the future.